Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com here and here today to talk about the business end of the Shopsmith bandsaw. We covered the, uh, the tensioning and the auto tracking in a previous video, but we haven't talked at all about what happens over on the side that does the cutting. And there's some really cool, unique features over there you're not going to want to miss. Before we get into that, though, I mentioned last week, I actually did something different. I, I posted a video over the weekend on the Shopsmith drill press that enough questions and comments and things came up that I felt the need to address it once again. So we did kind of a rehash video in the middle of the week, and I really liked it. And I liked that there was a lot of conversation going on. So I want to adopt that model. So we're going to do a video topic each weekend, and then at some point midweek, we will, we will rehash that based on your questions, your comments, and your cheap shots. Now, I also said I'd lo love to have a name for that. Um, it obviously should contain parenthetically the title of the previous video or hint to that. But, um, you know, one suggestion was way back Wednesday. I like that, except for there's no guarantee that it'll be Wednesday. It'll be midweek. And, um, in fact, when my real-life schedule gets back after COVID calms down, um, I may have to switch when I put out the recorded video, pre-recorded video versus when I do a response. Anyway, we'll, we'll cross that uh, bridge when we get to it. But now let's talk about the Shopsmith bandsaw once again, but let's talk about what happens over on this side. Um, the Shopsmith bandsaw, as I mentioned before, is fantastic. It is designed for the home woodworker, and uh, within its capacities, I find it to be one of the best bandsaws available. So let's pull the cover off of this. The cover is held on with, in, in this particular version, with these removable knobs. Uh, Shopsmith, a couple years ago, uh, went, because of, of uh, Canada's uh, safety rules, they went now with a washer with a cap screw that you use your, your Shopsmith toolbox, the 532nd hex wrench, to remove it. I like the knobs. I've always liked the knobs. I don't want to have to use that wrench for everything. But um, anyway, <clears throat> what we have here is we have a, a, an adjustable top guide. This guide has side guides uh, blocks that help to keep the blade running straight and true, and a thrust bearing. And I'm going to take this guard off so we can take a better look, and I'm going to move you in close. So the guard is mounted on there uh, with a nut on that bolt and a bolt that passes through. And those are on this casting that is holding the thrust bearing and the guide blocks. Now, one thing to note about most bandsaws, when they're properly uh, aligned, the uh, blade, the back of the blade, runs against the thrust bearing on the bottom that's under the table and is ever so slightly behind the, um, uh, the blade here on the top. The idea behind that is when we push in to make our cut, we will push the blade under some, some forward pressure. We will be pushing it against the bearing. Now you might ask, why would that matter? Uh, why not just go ahead and put it there? You know, that's, that's additional wear and tear on that thrust bearing that wouldn't have to take place. But um, the most important thing to know about on the Shopsmith bandsaw is because our, our blade is tracking because of this auto tracking bearing back here. Every single blade we put on here, it's tracking to the same spot. Um, it, we're not in the middle of the wheel like you are on most bandsaws. Therefore, the back of the blade, regardless of the size of the blade, will always be back against the bottom bearing and just ahead here. Now, how much is ahead? Um, the current manual says uh, 1 64th of an inch. Uh, the point is, when you're spinning this, that, that, uh, that bearing shouldn't spin. Okay? It's only when you're applying pressure. Now, we do have the ability to move these guide blocks forward and back, and we, and we do that by turning this knob back here. And you can see that uh, my guide blocks are too far back right now. I want to bring those up to where they are just behind the gullet, which is the deepest part of the tooth, and I want them to be behind the gullet even when I'm pushing against and hitting that thrust bearing. So I want to set that forward and check it while I'm putting a little bit of pressure in. 
What you don't want to have happen is these teeth, which are set, one is bent a little to the left, one to the right, and so on. You don't want to push this in and have that, that um, set of the tooth knocked out, okay? Uh, so with that adjustment made, that's it. That's all there is to it. Now, I do need to be able to adjust the height of this because I want the guide blocks as close to the wood without causing any pinching because the more distance we put between the guide block and the board, the more blade is exposed potentially for injury, but also it will want to wander more. So check this out. The ShopSmith post here, by flipping that handle, and the handle that I use to raise and lower this, by flipping that back, it locks it in place. And that's a brilliant design. And what makes that work properly is better explained inside the saw. What you can see here is I have two brass set screws that are locked in place with these little lock nuts. And if I ever need to move uh, in the first setup, if I need to get that thrust bearing further forward, I need to move those two set screws. Now, which way am I moving it? Well, if that post needs to come forward, then those screws need to come forward. And we want to do this equal in equal measure, so try a quarter turn with both of them and then tighten everything down and check. And uh, once you get that bearing where you want it, you then lock the lock nuts. Now, I see people get these out of whack because they will turn just one or loosen just one. If you turn just one, pushing it forward, that's going to make that post swing forward, right? Or if you push the bottom one in, it'll push everything back. So you want to keep those equal. But then what will happen is, once you have moved those forward to get your bearing forward, this will no longer lock. And people will complain that it no longer has the tension on it. So that's where understanding how this post works is important. This rod right here that you see on the handle is bent at a 90 degrees, 90 degree angle, and it goes all the way up inside here. And it's not perfectly round. It has a flat side on it. So right now I'm feeling the flat on the back. That flat is facing the back. And as a result of that, when that flat is facing the back, it is loose. When you rotate it, that makes this post a little bit wider and it locks it in place. Now what is it locking in place against? Well, it's not this face because it doesn't touch this face. It's touching those two bolts. It's not this side or that side, it's the back side. And if you look right here, you can see a black leaf spring. Now, if we swing this around the corner and look in from the side a little bit. So now from another angle and with a little bit of light on the subject, you can see that what we have here is a bolt. In fact, it's the tip of a bolt. The head of the bolt is back there behind that steel leaf spring. So if I take this bolt and I rotate it counterclockwise, I'm basically driving that bolt forward, that will pull that leaf spring forward and apply some more pressure against the back of that bar. So if you move these two uh, brass screws forward and this becomes loose, you're going to want to turn this screw forward as well. Not every one of these bandsaws have this nylon bolt here. This nylon bolt was added, I don't know, probably in the 90s, maybe early 2000s, so that you could put a little bit of pressure that when this is loose, it doesn't just fall. And uh, that's adjustable. We can tighten it or loosen it. It's not a bad idea. This entire casting is held in place by these two bolts, and those bolt to the back of the saw. Now, I'm not entirely sure why I'm letting you make me do this. <laughs> but uh, to see this best, um, I think we're going to remove the table. So we do that by removing the four bolts that hold the table onto the trunnions. And this is something that you should never, ever have to do with your bandsaw. And to get to those back ones, we're going to rotate the table using the table tilt adjustment here. And just move it, move it on the trunnions. There we go. 
as always, everything is harder than it needs to be. All right, with the table off, let's take a moment to look at this and see if you can come to some of the same conclusions I did. First off, this blade is not uh, aligned properly to these guide blocks, or said another way, the guide blocks need to come forward. So if this saw had been cutting, that blade would have been wandering all over the place. Additionally, these tires are just dry as a bone, and I've already purchased silicone tires to replace them. We'll, we'll cover that in a future video. But what I want you to observe here is that these guide blocks are above the thrust bearing. The thrust bearing is down below. We'll take a look at that at another angle in a second. And that's the way that God intended for band saws to be built. <laughs> um, it, it will turn this knob here and we can bring those guide blocks forward. All right, there's the thrust bearing down below the guide blocks. And if I give this upper wheel a spin, you can see it is in contact with that thrust bearing. Another thing to note about the thrust bearing on the Shopsmith bandsaw, it is set so that the bearing, uh, the, the face of the bearing here, the edge, is what is rolling against the blade. Or I said the other way, it's configured so that the back of the blade is rubbing against the face of the ball bearing. You will see many bandsaws where that is set at 90 degrees and the blade is running across the face of the bearing, which just wears the bearing out. I don't know why they ever did that. It's uh, kind of a goofy design, but it's been done by a lot of folks. Now you can see here that there is adjustment left and right by loosening the bolt here, and that nut is captured. And by loosening the bolt, I can move this entire assembly left and right so I can get my blade aligned with the center of that thrust bearing. Once that is positioned, I can bring my guide blocks in and they will also be centered on that casting. So let's talk about this configuration. Why aren't both of those guide blocks straight? It would have been a simpler casting to produce. And in fact, there are bandsaws on the market that both the top and the bottom guide blocks are identical and they're made with the blocks going straight in. Now that's done to make the, uh, the bandsaw cheaper. And if you tilted your table 45 degrees and that guide block was sticking out here, the only way to make that work is if you take the guide block and you mount it lower. Well, if you mount it a little bit lower, it's now in the way of the ball bearing. So they mount it below the ball bearing. Uh, and this is not the way it was made to be. Now, the same thing is true on many band saws with their top guide blocks. They will make those so that they're going in straight across, almost as if they just put one in and cut it in half. And by having that configuration, when you tilt your table, you would have to raise your upper guide blocks higher. And again, the more distance we have between the top and the bottom guide blocks, the more distance we have from the top and the bottom guide blocks, the more potential we have for that blade to wander and drift. So uh, talking about these other bandsaws, why even mention them? Well, there's a lot of great designed, well-designed bandsaws on the market. Unfortunately, very few of them are still being produced the way they were originally designed. Going back to the 1930s, Delta's 14-inch bandsaw was an amazing bandsaw, and the guide blocks below the table are super beefy, and they're mounted very close to the bottom of the table. And I don't like the way the, the thrust bearing is configured, but you know, you can't have it all, unless of course you have the Shopsman bandsaw. It has the additional advantage of being able to have a riser block that would raise from their standard six inch depth of cut up to 12 inches. That's the one thing we can't do with the Shopsmith bandsaw. And now what changed all this? Well, back in the 80s and into the 90s and since, the, uh, the, the Taiwanese jumped into the power tool market and they started by uh, cloning, they like to call it, knocking off all the big brands. So uh, you could buy a generic bandsaw, a joiner, a planer, a table saw that looked just like the Delta, just like the Powermatic, just like the, uh, the general tools up in Canada and uh, Couple of the brands that came along, Grizzly, of course, we all know, uh, Jet. Um, and then over the years, the big guys just figured, okay, if we can't beat them, we got to join them. 
what, what the Taiwanese did is they took those designs and they reconfigured things so they could produce them on the cheap. And things that most folks would never notice, like the fact that the bottom block uh, guide, the bottom guide blocks are actually just the casting from above the table that they, that they just reconfigured. And they, they, they put aside all the wonderful engineering that was in the original uh, bottom guide on the Delta and uh, just basically copied the upper guide block. That put the blade unsupported over many more inches than it ever was. And then things got even worse then as the Chinese took over from the Taiwanese and uh, the designs just went out the window. Um, you know, I, I mention this because I know this stuff firsthand. I was working for Shopsmith in the 80s when this bandsaw hit the market and the tool that it was designed to go on. This is a total shop bandsaw, which is a clone made in Taiwan copying the Shopsmith designs. Now, um, just for fun, I want to show you a couple of the details and a couple of the things that they got wrong. And one thing I'll promise you in the future, I, I got to work on the lighting in here and we'll, we'll get this right. But anyway, um, here it is side by side with the Shopsmith bandsaw. This is cast aluminum and it's actually sand cast. So they take an original part, press it into moist sand, then they pour molten aluminum into that. It completely changes the size of everything. Um, this is what happens, what happens when you reverse engineer something. Um, this bandsaw is die cast. There is a mold that the, uh, the aluminum is injected into and it gives us very precise uh, detail. You can see that there's a web of, of pockets, and yeah, there are places that collect sawdust. But, but more importantly, they make this arm beefy, so when we're applying tension, uh, it doesn't flex. However, there is a part we do want to flex. Do you remember when we talked about the tilting? I mentioned that in the original Shopsmith bandsaw patent, it was designed that with a wide blade under great tension, this wheel is supposed to tilt forward slightly, um, which changes the pitch of the, uh, for the tracking. I'm sorry, it tilts back slightly. Sorry about that. The idea is it, it takes some of the pressure off the thrust bearings and the auto track bearings. Now it does that because it's a precision uh, designed and die cast piece of aluminum that is in a particular shape. It was engineered this way. I have some rare earth magnets. We can come in here and you'll notice the magnets don't stick. However, we come over here to the total shop, that's cast iron. And so there is no way that that will perform the same as the Shopsmith one. Um, and how were they to know? They were, they were reverse engineering the thing. They, they just did with, with, with it what they did. The cover on this is cast aluminum. It is so much heavier than the Shopsmith bandsaw. And as I get older, I start appreciating how little certain things weigh so that I don't have to lift them anymore. Um, the, uh, the, the, the components here of the auto track, it must have bewildered them because the original version of this bandsaw, when they knocked it off, they didn't copy this. Instead, they added to the saw a traditional knob on top and a tilt. Um, and then eventually they figured out that now there's a reason why it was designed the way it is. But you can still see some of the traces of that redesign. Let me show you. So look back at that back casting. You can see there's a channel right here where they had originally intended for this shaft to run in that channel. There's a couple other differences as well, but suffice it to say that they reversed engineered it and they built it the way they thought it could be built, but they didn't know how it was supposed to be built. So even though the patents had expired, they didn't use the patents as a, as a model for their design. Uh, it's a, a, a novelty now. I, I, I don't intend to use it. I'll, I need to get the rust off the table and, and spruce it up a little bit. But uh, it's a piece of history because uh, that company is gone and uh, the companies in, in Taiwan that knocked it off have moved on to other things. So anyway, um, please leave your comments below. Ask any questions you might have. 
And uh, we'll hit on some more details of this when we see each other again in the middle of the week with that episode. Make it a great day, and we'll talk to you again soon.